Welcome back to Statement Piece. Today we have a very special guest, Courtney Reed. Right. Shall we do our current events? Yes. Our first current event is regarding Great Britain and the EU, and they reached a deal on Brexit. So this is according to a New York Times post that came out on December 24th, 2020. Basically, Britain and the EU struck a trade agreement on Thursday, settling a divorce that has stretched over more than four years and also setting the terms for a post-Brexit future. Second of all, Congress approved a $900 billion stimulus relief package. Individual adults making up to $75,000 a year would receive a $600 payment. A couple earning up to $150,000 a year would get twice that amount. And unemployed Americans will receive an extra $300 a week for 11 weeks. I saw a tweet that said the government said we're giving you enough to buy the Bottega Puddle Boots in Kiwi, but not brown. Wake up, people, because the Bottega Veneta Boots in Kiwi are 600, but in brown in 630. Our next current event is brought to you by Business of Fashion. Basically, there is new evidence that over half a million Uyghurs and other Turkic Muslim minorities are being forced by the Chinese government to pick cotton widely used in the fashion industry. And so this made headlines and also surprised a lot of shoppers and angered politicians, considering that there are major businesses from American sportswear giants to French luxury groups who aren't able to guarantee that their products aren't taking advantage of these communities. And this is due to the fact that the scale of this whole scheme feeds textile and garment production and activities across Asia and makes it highly likely that many fashion brands are going to be implicated. All right, our last current event is a quick discussion on the Kardashian Christmas outfits. <laughs> I think they were all really eccentric. Kylie's was the only one that was very classic. She wore a long red dress that was sparkly. What did you think about Kim's outfit? It was a silk skirt on the bottom and then a bustier type of situation on top that had carved abs into it. A lot of people compared it to the Hulk. I honestly don't really understand the look. I like the really? hair, ponytail, the earrings, like all of it looks really gaudy to me. I honestly really like it, but I really like like very bold things like this. I mean, she it gets really people looks talking. like a cosplay character and I don't, that just doesn't align with her brand like all of it like all of the proportions and every aspect of this outfit don't make sense to me yeah I think that's sort of signature for the brand that made it Skia Pirelli because Mm -hmm. their whole jewelry line was like essentially face masks and different facial pieces all right and now on to the episode before we get started we wanted to note that we do discuss a little bit of the dynamics of north korea in relation to the human hair trade we wanted to say that wigs and human hair from north korea may not necessarily be questionable it's been brought to our attention that because wigs eyelash extensions and human hair are one of the few unsanctioned North Korean products. North Korean business operators have grown to be quite economically reliant on them. Welcome to the podcast. So if you can just give us a little bit of background on yourself and what you're studying in school and everything like that. Yeah, so I'm a junior at Claremont McKenna College studying philosophy, politics, and economics. So outside of just being a general hair consumer, I think I started wearing wigs senior year of high school. So when I got into college and I saw this opportunity um, for a fellowship after our freshman year, I applied for it and they sent me to India and China for I think two weeks to just study the international hair trade and learn about sourcing practices. So when I was there I actually interviewed one of my would-be vendors. I didn't know that at the time but I got to interview him and learn about his processes and things. So when I got home I, I just feel like I learned so much and saw there were holes in the industry in terms of transparency and things like that so I kind of wanted to start my own business that focused on transparency and the ethical the ethics of things. So what kind of ethical issues did you observe when you were on your trip? Yeah actually some of the one of the biggest things I actually noticed when I was at home like researching for the proposal because if you go to any hair store or search up any boutique online and you look at like what they brand their hair is hair as they branded it as like Malaysian, Brazilian, Peruvian, all these different random countries but if you look at the stats, like the two biz- the two biggest exporters are China and India. So if everybody is saying their hair is Brazilian and Malaysian, but it actually comes from China and India, like there's a disconnect there between like the manufacturing and the distributor. So, and I just think that just does it, that does a disservice to the consumer and the women that are actually dyeing their hair in the first place. Like when I actually got there, I wanted to learn about how they were incentivizing people to donate their hair in the first place. So in India, it's very much religious. Like the hair would be cut regardless but in China it's very much an economic 
system in which like women need to support their families so they cut their hair but so i think that's where a lot of work needs to be done in terms of ethics but um, i'm just doing the best that i can without having my own sourcing team after doing the research and i think i saw this video on vice about how some women had their hair cut against their will and things like that and it wasn't consensual i was like okay that's really kind of fucked up so after i started doing research and i saw that video i was like okay i know especially like black women a lot wear hair enhancement hair extensions things like that so if anyone needs to be doing the the work and doing research it's like my demographic because we spend the most on it and i'm just like not comfortable with the idea of someone selling things to us in our community and like lying about where it's coming from it just i don't know why it's wrong but it just doesn't sit right with me so that's a lot of where it started yeah yeah and i feel like a lot of different industries such as the fashion industry is one that we've kind of focused on in the podcast and showing that consumers are demanding more transparency mm -hmm. and just knowing where things are sourced and how they are and if they are in an ethical fashion. So to speak more about after it is sourced, did you get to see kind of like the processing and everything and what happens after these companies get the hair? I didn't actually get to go to the factory. So I would say it's like there's three stages you have like you're in the village cutting it and then you go into the factory where things are like clean, sewn and packaged. And then like I went to his distribution center, which was in this huge factory, um, which is where he would like send out his packages and things. So I went to the, the final stage area. So I got to see like the wigs finally put together and like um, his assistant was there and they were filming and things like that. So but I think what interests me the most outside of you know when it comes to ethics of course it's important to make sure the women you're getting your hair from are paid fairly and want to do it but like when you get to that middle stage of um like the factory and the cleaning and packaging that's where a lot of things get like twisted up and mucked up and you don't really know what product you're getting based on how it's processed in the factory there's this whole timeline and things but when hair started to like really gain popularity outside of like celebrities and like regular people started wearing wigs and weaves and extensions and things, like China had to keep up with the demand. So they would start mixing in like animal fibers and like fabric in into the hair. So like when they sent it out, it looked fine, but then you wash it a couple times and it gets tangled and matted. And um, they also do this thing where they'll, they'll soak the hair in a chemical bath and it strips off the cuticles because like when you have hair that's not cut directly from the root and it just falls to the ground and is bundled up the cuticles are all in all different directions and you can't really put them back in order so they strip it entirely and coat it and so you sell it to someone who has no idea what they're doing they're like oh this is such a great deal it's got this bundle for like 50 dollars and then they wash it and it's terrible quality and they can't use it again so a lot of that is tied to how it's sourced so how it's sourced directly impacts the kind of product you're getting at the end so how did these companies kind of go about and i guess their whole outreach process in these villages and then how do the women in these villages find out about these companies and understand sort of the consent process and where their hair is actually going to end up? That was a really good question. It was a lot of what I was trying to ask this vendor when I was, you know, in China. Like I speak Chinese, but not that well, like survival Chinese. So a lot of my questions were like, oh, are they paid fairly? You know, things like that. But from what I understood, they, they go on rounds. So they come back to the same villages, at least the vendor that I talked to, they go to the same village every couple months to years, but they are like contracted. so. Like you're not supposed to be selling your hair to another, you know, collector, but it does seem consensual at that stage. The only questionable thing is when these companies are making their lace pieces, they send them to North Korea and then they send back, get sent back to China and then they're sent out to, you know, like America or Africa or wherever. So that's highly questionable. Anything coming out of North Korea, we're just like, I don't know about that. But since COVID happened, there's been border closures like a lot of companies like mine and bigger are they don't have lace pieces to sell anymore because they're not able to send to north korea so we're just kind of waiting it out at this point but if you're getting hair from india it's normal it's fine mm -hmm. and is there an age limit or cap on the people that are being asked for for their hair i have no idea but logistically and if we think about the reasons why people are selling their hair in these like rural villages it's to make money so if your hair is long enough you're probably going to get it cut as, as long as you're like a child and your parents like, yeah, we need money so you're gonna get your hair cut, you know, it's, it's kind of just like a thing that you have to do to get by, from what I can understand. Yeah. So then after learning about 
things like how it was sourced in North Korea and stuff like that? How did it impact your own consumption of wigs? And how did you try and verify transparency with the places you're sourcing your own wigs? Yeah. So I actually didn't know that the lace pieces were made in North Korea until this summer. Because my vendor, he really prides himself on being transparent and open and communicative with his clients. And so he posted a video. He was like, hey, guy, he posted this in like June or July. He's like, hey, North Korea closed their borders because of COVID. Lace is going to start running out by the end of the year. And sure enough, companies are were scrambling to get their stock. So what he actually started doing was training his own fleet domestically in China. So we just had to like wait for him to retrain people to start building up his stock again. He's slowly getting back to where he was. But I actually had no idea at first. I thought I knew everything. I didn't know everything. So then I know you also have initial cut. So do you mind explaining a bit about what that is? And is it like an LLC, your own business? Or do you just kind of do it as a side hustle? Yeah, so it is my own business. I do have an LLC. I got it last summer. Um, I actually started it, let's see, at the beginning of sophomore year. Couldn't afford to keep the website running, but I actually got a grant in uh, this past April. And so that's been helping me get off the ground and like pay for ads and marketing and stuff like that. So it's a lot of fun. It's just, it was really bad timing with like the COVID thing and the lace shortages, but I'm actually getting a few orders like slow and steady, but I decided to launch my TikTok at the same time or like they kind of blew up at the same time. So I'm getting a lot of traffic from TikTok and people like seeing my hair on there and they're like, oh my God, like, where'd you get your hair from? I'm like, oh, initial cut, go check out my Instagram. So it's, it's kind of, it's working out. It's working out well. Yeah, that's so cool. So well, what was your foundation story with that? Like what in, motivated you to start your own business and how did you kind of piece all the manufacturing parts together? The same way I learned how to make my own wigs is how I learned how to start a wig business is from the grand YouTube platform. Like there's so many girls on there that are just like, oh, I did this, this, and this, and this is where I am now. And I'm like, this sounds so easy combined with like my goal of education and transparency and I combine that with like all these resources that are free and online like I could do this easy it wasn't easy because I was broke (laughs) but combined with the funding I got it's been pretty smooth at this point I've like run into some bumps here and there but generally with customer service just do whatever the customer wants and you'll be fine it's just like it seems like a lot of work but at the end of the day like the joy that I get seeing a client it's like I really like this piece like I'm so glad that I bought from you it makes everything worth it in the end what's the process when you go from vendor to yourself and then to your customer. I actually have a wig that I was working on for a client and like if you start with the lace piece and then if you turn it around like it's like sewn in the back there's tracks here and that's what I do. I do like the hand sewing piece. When you get it from vendors you get them in like separate pieces so I get the frontal which is the lace piece and then two to three bundles of hair depending on how full I want it and so I do the hand sewing. I do my own color. A lot of people are really into like the bleached like honey blonde, bleach blonde hair right now. So that's kind of what I'm specializing in because like I wear it myself. And so people see it on me and they're like, oh, I want that. So I'm like my own walking advertisement. How long does it take for you to dye and sew and get the whole wig together? Yeah, so my first one was like natural color. It took me about 10 hours to get to sew it from start to finish. Now sewing probably is about six or seven hours and a little bit faster, but the dyeing process can take anywhere from like two to three days, depending on what color I'm going for, because I hand bleach everything and then I let it air dry overnight and then I do a second color or a second um, processing and then maybe a third depending. So it takes a while and I'm definitely undercharging for labor at this point because I'm like not professionally trained and it's really luck of the draw. Like whenever I'm bleaching anything, I'm just crossing my fingers and hope and hoping it comes out okay because like I know someone paid a lot of money for this. Yeah. So then how do you go about pricing then? I already have my like the actual hair bundles upcharge so I make a profit and then I charge a hundred dollars for labor so like ten dollars uh minimum wage for 10 hours which is not quite how long it takes but whatever and then um I charge them for shipping so I don't know I don't think that's quite right but again like I'm just starting out I don't think I'm like there are companies out there selling wigs for like $1,500 like I'm not there yet yeah I could see myself getting there just based on the quality that I'm putting out of the actual hair at what point did you 
realized that you wanted to start making your own wigs and selling it? Was it just that you didn't want? Well, I started making my own wigs just because like, like my first wig I bought from a company and was like, it was like, okay. And I was like, oh, I can do this myself. Like, why wouldn't I do it myself? It's cheaper. So I made my first wig by myself. I hadn't had a company at that point. Then the second wig I made was blonde and people really liked that. Like I bleached it myself and they were like, oh my God, it's so cute. And then people were just like asking me to make wigs for them, like outside of like a professional, they're just like, oh, can you make this for me? Like, I see you do it. So I was like, okay, it's clearly there's demand. So why don't I kind of make this a foundation, get a platform for this? What was the timeline for that? When did you start launching it as selling it to others? Yeah. So the first launch of my company was mainly for bundles. I wasn't really trying to do the whole hand sewing thing because it's a lot of work. I was like, I'm going to sell them to you. You can get a sew-in, you can make a wig yourself. I'm selling you like the bits and pieces. But then um, what I'm saying is like me being my own walking advertisement is so true. Like they'd see it on me and be like, I want that in whatever form it is. So I wear wigs like every day. People want wigs based on what they see on me. So I just kind of tapped into the demand that I was seeing from other people. That first launch was in, let's say, September of 2019. And then I shut it down over winter break. So let's say January, February, relaunched it this past September of 2020. And so I've been up for a couple months and I've had so many more sales than the first time. I had like zero sales the first time. So this is going much better. So what platform are you selling on? I'm selling I'm selling like on Instagram through like the Facebook marketplace, Instagram marketplace. And I have mm. my own website as well. Uh, Would you shift away from Instagram or do you think that social media is kind of an integral part of your business at this point? I definitely think social media is a huge, huge part. I know Instagram is definitely trying to hop on that Amazon wave because, you know, they changed their whole layout. Now, like the shop tab is like where notifications used to be. I think that if a business doesn't have a social media account in this day and age, it's going to be really, really hard for them to like reach new audiences. And I think even there's room on TikTok for them and future iterations to get more of a like marketplace feature on there. Yeah. Do you think your age and being on a college campus, kind of that demographic helps at all? I think in general, it is helpful because there's just like a lot more support in that sense. But my target demographic is not college students. So in that way, it's not really super helpful. But it's just nice to have a large pool of people that you can be like, hey, can you like push this a post for me? Can you share this? Can you like tag people in this for me? And like, that's mainly where I see the benefit of being like a college student starting a business. Do you see it growing where you would add someone else onto your team who would also help you make wigs? Honestly, yeah. Like I live with roommates this semester and one of my friends is like, I'll literally like help just teach me and I'll help you out. And I'm like, I'm "I'm "I'm not getting enough orders right now to do that. But but, like, it's so labor intensive and it takes so long. Like if I was getting to the point where I was getting like one to two orders a week, I definitely would have to bring somebody else on to help me with just like the manual aspect. So I know you mentioned that you had to take a break in between, um, like you said, you took a break off during winter break and then relaunched it. So what kind of was the reasoning behind closing your first phase and then what motivated you to relaunch? Yeah, so I closed it the first time because I was losing money, like just in terms of having to keep the website up. So I used Shopify, it was like $20, $30 a month. I wasn't getting any sales so I shut it down kind of revamped my business plan I was like okay now what do I want to do here I applied to a pitch competition got some um, seed funding so that helped me you know pay for the LLC get the site up and running and I also joined this platform called Built by Girls and they match you up with a mentor in their network for three months so my first mentor was a woman named Catherine who works for Facebook Um, And she manages like all the professional athlete Facebook pages in North America, like the team pages. So she showed me how to work Facebook ads, Instagram ads, like kind of helped me hook up my um, account to my Shopify and stuff like that. So that made me feel more comfortable to keep going. And she was really um, helpful in terms of like looking over my ad campaigns and seeing what worked and what didn't. So, and then how do you go about certifying your own supply chain to be ethical and kind of coming from where you wanted to? And how did your trip inform that? A lot of the problems comes from the fact that there, there is no certification process. There's very few regulations in terms of hair imports and stuff like that. But there there was actually a story that broke a couple months ago about, you know, 
the Uyghur Muslims in China being forced to either cut their hair and sell it or actually like work in the factories to send out the hair. And so I posted about that on my um, business account. And I was like, this is why it's important to make sure the people you're buying your hair from knows where it's coming from. But like, it's, it's, it didn't really get that much traction. I don't know a lot of people, I don't know of a lot of people like hearing about the story, but I did hear that there was like a bill in Congress, but like it was very low profile. But even if I'm putting the information out there, like it doesn't really help if people don't care to understand what I'm saying or why it's important. You're working from both ends. And so on one hand, I really want to educate people. What is the hair industry? Why is it unregulated? Where is your hair coming from? And like, why should you care? And then I just like plug in the information of like, this is where my hair is coming from. This is why I think it's important. This is like why you should buy from me. So like I started working on a documentary back when I did when I did the fellowship after my freshman year and I got a bunch of clips and stuff. So I'm still kind of working on building that out and, you know, putting it on a platform where people will actually care to watch it. But, you know, even as I said before, like I thought my hair coming from China was 100% ethical and it was not because, you know, things get, you know, muddled into when you get North Korea involved. But like now that, He's retrained his own fleet. I had to make sure like, oh, is he going to stay with this fleet? Is he going to go back to North Korea when it, like things reopen? So there's a lot of communication on my end, but it's hard. Yeah. So did you find the vendor on your trip? I found him online before I went, which was like such a blessing because it was so hard to find vendors. Most vendors just operate through like Alibaba and AliExpress and like DHK and stuff, which is like super shady because it's generally just one company that owns like 10 different pages and there's no way for you to know that until you like click through and you look at their details and stuff. But they're marketing these products as different types of hair, but it's all the same hair coming from the same guy. So I found him on YouTube actually. And he was like, I want to teach you, you know, like what people lie about in the hair industry and stuff. So I was like, yes, this is what I'm looking for. So how do you go about ensuring that these vendors are kind of following the same practices that you want to follow? I only have two vendors and I haven't changed since I found them, you know, back in 2019, 2018. You know, one of them actually markets themselves as like an ethical distributor because their hair comes from temples. There's, it's still up from debate whether or not hair from temples is ethical or not, but like it's better than you know, coming from an economic system in China where people have no other choice but to sell their hair for money. That one is just like, kind of like, a, there's no right answer. But generally hair coming from India and it's from temples, you know, the people chose to cut their hair. And that's the real, you know, the center of the problem there. But when you get into China, you have to know like, who is having their hair cut? Are they paid well? Like, did they consent to it? And then like, and you, if you get into, because it's like such a mass scale and they have a lot of demand to meet, you have to think about like, are they paying their factory workers well? Are their factory workers like working in good conditions? And then like, I didn't realize the lace pieces were being made in North Korea. So you have to think about those things and, you know, like border wars and things like that. But generally, this guy runs his platform and being honest. So I know if I had a question, he would answer it. It's just a, in the matter of like asking in the right way. So he doesn't just say what you want. I remember I was talking to someone back first doing the research for it. And they're like, if you're, oh, I was actually watching on YouTube a YouTube video about this girl who had start her, started her business. And she was like, when you're talking to these vendors, you can't ask, is your hair like cuticly aligned or no? Cause they're just going to say yes. Cause they want everyone to know every, they, everyone wants to have cuticly aligned hair. So it's just like, like a mind trick of like how you ask their questions. So I guess one thing I've been thinking a lot about, especially from our last wig episode is just kind of wigs place in pop culture. I know you mentioned you've kind of I'm seen. Just about to ask yeah. about <laughs> I know you mentioned you've seen a lot of Americans wearing wigs more and even it being more prevalent outside of the Black community. So why do you think that's been happening in the U.S.? And why do you think most of the sourcing comes from China and India and then it's brought to countries like here and Africa where wigs are used more so yeah i think it's definitely like a rise in the use of social media and just platforms in which sharing content is so it's so easy to access things and find out answers to questions that you previously wouldn't have answers to like before if you think about how i was able to start my business or even learn how to make a wig like if we didn't have youtube i just wouldn't know how to like all that information would have kind of been locked behind the doors of some professional hairstylist that would charge me $200 for like a class. And now in terms of Instagram, like there's this entire movement of people that are making money off of providing content that's like stimulating to people and engaging. And so I think one of the main things people do is they put on these fashion, these flashy clothes and like they do their hair really well and they sell you stuff based on looking good. 
And so a lot of these like LA influencers and stuff, they like to wear wigs, they like their hair to look perfect. And that's where hair comes in as like an accessory now. And so that's where you see a lot of people buying like two, three wigs at a time rather than like someone buying a wig, you know, to go to church in, if that makes sense. And I think it's just like a lot of secrets that were, you know, tied into the like celebrity sphere have trickled down into, you know, the average Americans. Yeah, that makes sense. I never really knew how celebrities change their hair up so much. Like I always thought that they just dyed it really frequently, but I feel like people like Kylie Jenner would make YouTube videos wearing a lot of wigs, but then that really made me think about the prevalence of wigs in the Black community. And then there's always a lot of talk about like the Jenners and Kardashians appropriating black culture. So I had always ruminated on that and kind of wondered if that's what was happening or... Yeah, how do you feel about people crediting Kylie Jenner for the rise in wigs? Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) But really quickly, like I just found I don't really follow the Kardashians or the Jenners on Instagram because it's just like not my cup of tea but Mm -hmm. I just found out that like their hair person actually sources their hair Germany or something Mm -hmm. or like Romania or it was some year somewhere in Europe which is like interesting because you would think that would come from China like everyone else's you know there's there's a lot of nuance behind the idea that like white people make things trendy by Mm -hmm. taking them from people of color whereas people of color were like looked down upon for these you know, habits or certain styles that they take and they think are cool and they get bullied for it by the same people that then turn around and turn it into a trend 10 years later and make money off of it, which is like, it's really annoying and it's hard to see as you grow up in those kinds of spaces and you see, you know, she popularized lips, having big lips when, you know, little girls got bullied for it years and years and years before and now they look at their screens and everyone's like, oh, I want lips like Kylie Jenner when you have them naturally. It's like not great. So then why do you think so much hair comes from India and China? I find it curious that so much hair comes from there. I think it just has to do with sheer population size. Like there's a lot of people in India and China. So naturally you're going to get more product from there. And yeah, I don't know. I think it's just like an American thing to want to look like amazing all the time or like a Western (laughs) thing to want to look amazing all the time. (laughs) When you get famous, like especially like American rappers or female rappers, like you have to look like a freak. You're wearing a costume every day. Like you can't look like a normal person ever or Mm -hmm. else it like ruins your image or something. It's, It's really interesting. Yeah, because I feel like it becomes a part of their brand. Yeah. I don't think I can name one female rapper right now that doesn't wear wigs like at all. I couldn't. So uh, do you plan on continuing your wig business in the future and after college and everything? I don't know. I was just talking about this with my friend's dad, but it's like the, the path I'm going in, there's like not a lot of space for hobbies outside of your job, at least in the beginning. Like, you know, finance is, you know, finance is finance, but there's not a lot of time on this side especially in like a starting analyst position to take up other things I'm just you know gonna see where it goes before graduation and if I have to pivot in a direction where I can't do hand sewing anymore and I just have to focus on like factory made wigs or I have to focus on selling bundles instead of the full pieces then that's what I'll have to do. How do you feel about hair in the professional space? I think about this all the time because <laughs> I'm literally like platinum blonde right now and it's mm-hmm. like on some people that's professional but on me is it seen as professional so we'll see how it goes I don't know because yeah. like I like having long hair I like having blonde hair so I've watched documentaries as well on like hair within the black community in a professional workspace like a lot of people feel like they have to wear wigs or like the debate I like I remember when Michelle Obama did a public appearance on natural hair it was like a big deal it's always kind of interesting I don't know I say abolish professionalism but <laughs> can't do that <laughs> so one question we like to ask all of our guests is what is your favorite statement piece I've been really into like rings recently like let me see if I can show them Mm -hmm. like this ring right here is my mom's undergraduate class ring from Florida State and I just stole it from her I wear it every day it's mine now like I graduated from Florida State and then this (laughs) one I just got it it's great it's like a sterling silver butterfly I, I my goal is to get them like on every finger of every hand like I just think it makes your hands look so like ethereal and like majestic just to have like decorations on them yeah so rings for sure like I'll wear a ring every day I love that thank you so much for being on and it was just great to hear about your story and everything it's really interesting yeah
thank you so much. Well, thank you to Courtney again for being on this week's episode. It was really interesting hearing about how a lot of the human hair trade takes place in China and in India. Also, I really love to hear how she basically is a self-made wig creator. I also think that it's really admirable to have any young entrepreneur And the fact that she had the courage to relaunch her business was, I think is something really admirable because a lot of entrepreneurs will just abandon ideas if it doesn't take off immediately. But I think the fact that she stuck with it and just tried to reform her business was a good move. Yes, definitely. Well, thank you to everyone who is listening. Please follow us on all of our platforms and we will see you next week. That's all for now, folks. Do-do-do-do-do-do.